the sin of Adam and its relationship to the redemption one in Christ and the doctrine of original sin in particular. So if you ever wondered about original sin and the church's teaching on that, Romans 5, 12 through 15 is a crucial passage. So let's read that together and then we'll try to unpack it a little. Paul says this, Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sin, sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. All right, so let's stop there. The first thing you want to highlight here is Paul's terminology of sin, right? So whenever Paul uses the word sin, in Greek, the term is hamartia. And I've mentioned elsewhere that this term means to miss the mark, right? To miss the target, so to speak. Um, And it's a common way of describing some kind of failure to love God or failure to love our neighbor, rightly. Some, uh, which usually manifests itself as a transgression or a violation or breaking one of the commandments of God. You can think here of the Ten Commandments, for example. So if a person commits idolatry, if a person blasphemes, a person commits murder, that's a hamartia, that's a sin, because they fail to love God or fail to love their neighbor by breaking one of the commandments of God. So in this case, Paul takes that term hamartia and he describes it, he almost personifies it, right? That Hamartia comes into the world, sin comes into the world through one man, and then death through sin. So the Greek word here for death, thanatos, um, just means death, right? It's the same as the English word. However, it can be utilized to refer to both spiritual death, right? In a sense, like the death of the soul, which is being separated from God, or physical death which is the separation of the soul and the body. So death always involves separation. It's one of the reasons we don't like it. Um, And it can either be of the physical or the spiritual kind. Now, when Paul talks about death and sin coming into the world through one man, the one man he has in mind here is, of course, the one man who stands at the beginning of the Bible, namely Adam, the first man in the Bible. And if you read through Genesis chapter 2 and 3 carefully, one of the things you'll notice is that the whole story revolves around sin and death. It revolves around a violation of God's first commandment, which is don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then the death that results from that. Right. So if you go back to Genesis, God says to Adam, you can eat of any of the trees of the Garden of Eden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat of that, you shall surely die. In the Hebrew word, there is like actually a doubling of the word for death. You shall die the death. That's what it says. Now, if you fast forward to chapter 3, when Adam eats of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and breaks the commandment of God, he does not physically die immediately, right? But he does spiritually die through sin. So he's separated from God. He's cast out of the Garden of Eden. And then eventually that spiritual separation that takes place through the the violation of the commandment, that spiritual death is going to manifest itself in physical death, right? So as he'll say, as God says to him, you are dust and to dust you shall return, right? And in Genesis 3, 22, it actually says that after that happens, God drives Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, lest eating of the fruit of the tree of life, they live forever, dot, dot, dot. So he drives them out. So in Genesis 2 and 3, God creates Adam and Eve to live in a state of immortality, to live in a state of grace, and to partake of the tree of life, which if they would eat, they would live forever. He never forbids them from partaking of that tree. In fact, he says you can eat of any tree in the garden, which would include the tree of life, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But once they eat of that tree and enter into a state of sin, they are now separated from God's grace, separated from God's presence, which is symbolized by 
them being driven out of the place of communion with God, which is the Garden of Eden. So Paul's kind of assuming that you know all of this. He's summarizing this account of the entry of sin and death into the world in the book of Genesis with this very terse line. As sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, then death spreads to everyone else because of that one man's sin. So it's a very important point because notice the sequence here. Um, it is sin that comes first and death that comes after, right? So Paul is presupposing here that, as Genesis says, God makes man good. He doesn't make him in a state of sin. And he also makes him, it fills him with life. He makes him to live. He creates him not just to live for a short time, but to be immortal, to live forever. But what happens is, because of sin, which the man chooses to do and he abuses his freedom, death now comes into human history. Death enters into human life, and he loses the grace of immortality with which he was created. And then it, of course, spreads to all other men. And then Paul goes on to say, sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, in other words, before Moses, but sin's not counted where there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses. So here, Paul is kind of depicting death almost like a king reigning over the world, right? Through Adam and up to the time of Moses. Even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam. Now, what's he mean there? It's very important. What he's saying here is, even those who didn't choose to violate the commandment of God, who didn't transgress in the way that Adam did, still bear the consequences of Adam's transgression because they are subject to the dominion of death. And the, the, big, the clearest example of this is the fact that, to this day, the unborn and those who are infants and even children die, right? It's not through their own fault. They didn't transgress. A child in the womb doesn't even have the ability to transgress. And even a little baby before the age of reason doesn't have the ability to transgress, to deliberately and with full knowledge break one of the commandments of God. Adam is the one who transgresses, but death reigns over all of his descendants, even those who did not commit a transgression, even those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. So what Paul's getting at here is this is the this is a Pauline biblical way of describing the church's later doctrine of original sin. Namely, that everyone who was born into this world, um, all human beings are born in a state of spiritual death, right? They are born deprived of the grace of original holiness with which Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and 3 were created by God to live forever. So they're all born subject to death, even those who have not, through any fault of their own, committed sin. And that's why the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church makes it very, it stresses the point that original sin is, um, it's analogous to human sin, but it's not the same as an actual sin, because it's a state and not an act.